moved by the requests of former comrades, I have related in careful and orderly fashion the illustrious deeds of the Franks in honour of the Saviour. When, at the command of God, they made an armoured pilgrimage to Jerusalem. In homely style, yet nevertheless truly, I have recounted what I deemed worthy to be committed to memory, and I have told it as well as I can, and just as I saw it myself. Although I do not dare to put this work of the Franks that I have mentioned on an equality with the distinguished achievements of the people of Israel, in what way, indeed, do these Franks differ from the Israelites and the Maccabees? In those lands, by my very side, I have seen them dismembered, crucified, flayed, shot with arrows, butchered, or killed by other kinds of martyrdom for the love of Christ. Or I have heard of it when I was far away, and yet they could be overcome neither by threats nor blandishments. Nay, even if the slayer's sword had come, many of us would not have refused to perish for the love of Christ. Oh, how many thousands of martyrs died a happy death on this expedition! In the year of our Lord, 1095, in the reign of the so-called Emperor Henry in Germany and King Philip in France, throughout Europe evils of all kinds waxed strong because of vacillating faith. Pope Urban then ruled in the city of Rome. But the devil, who always desires man's destruction and goes about like a raging lion, seeking whom he may devour, stirred up to the confusion of people a certain rival to Urban, Wybert by name. What wonder that the whole world was a prey to disturbance and confusion, for when the Roman Church, which is the source of correction for all Christianity, is troubled by any disorder, the sorrow is communicated from the nerves of the head to the members subject to it, and these suffer sympathetically. When he heard, too, that interior parts of Romania were held oppressed by the Turks and that Christians were subjected to destructive and savage attacks, he was moved by compassionate pity. So Urban, a man prudent and revered, conceived a work by which later the whole universe prospered for he restored peace and re-established the rights of the church in their pristine condition. And with a lively determination, he also made an effort to drive out the pagans from the Christian lands. Therefore, since he endeavoured in every way to glorify everything which was God's, almost all voluntarily submitted themselves to his paternal direction. And so, I, Fulcher of Chartres, went with the other pilgrims, and for the benefit of posterity I have carefully and diligently stored all this in my memory, just as I witnessed it. This video is sponsored by Magellan TV, the documentary streaming service. Question: What's the largest castle in the world? Is it A. Windsor Castle in England, B. Malbork Castle in Poland, or C. Himeji Castle in Japan? Yes, that's right, it's Malbork Castle, thus proving that if an Englishman's home is his castle, then a Polishman's home is a, a very big castle. And so, a great recommendation from Magellan's collection this week is Knights 4K, in which you can discover more about these supposedly chivalrous warriors and their lovely big stone houses. Magellan TV have supported this channel for more than a year, and they're a great choice if you like documentaries. They have more than 3,000 works to choose from, and you can now take advantage of an exclusive offer, 30% off an annual membership. This gives you an entire year for less than $3.50 a month. You can simply click on the link in the description to claim your discounted membership today. Thanks. We West Franks traversed Gaul, and travelling through Italy came to Lucca, a far-famed city. Near there we met Pope Urban, Robert the Norman, and Stephen, Count of Blois, talked with him and others who wish likewise. Having received his blessing, we joyfully advanced to Rome. Many who had come thus far with us waited no longer, but at once, with disgraceful cowardice, returned to their homes. We, however, reached Bari, a rich seaport town. There we addressed our supplicants to God in the Church of St. Nicholas. 
Then, coming to port, we decided to cross at once, but because we lacked seamen and because fortune might play us false, and because, furthermore, it was winter time, which exposed us to dangers, Robert, Count of Normandy, was obliged to withdraw into Calabria, and there he spent the whole winter season. Then, many of the Crusaders, abandoned by their leaders and fearing future want, sold their weapons there, and taking up against their pilgrim staves, ignominiously returned to their homes. This desertion debased them before God and man, and it redounded to their shame. Oh, what a great and beautiful city is Constantinople! How many churches and palaces it contains, fashioned with wonderful skill! How many wonderful things may be seen even in the streets or courts! It would be too tedious to enumerate what wealth there is there of every kind, of gold, of silver, of every kind of robes, and of holy relics. After we were sufficiently rested, our leaders, having taken counsel, made under oath a treaty with the Emperor at his own instigation. When this had been accomplished, we crossed the sea, which is called the Arm of St. George, and hastened, then, to the city of Nicaea. It was then in possession of Turks from the east, a valiant race of very expert archers. These, indeed, had crossed the Euphrates River from Persia fifty years before, and had subjected themselves to the whole land of Romania as far as the city of Nicomedia. Oh, how many severed heads and bones of the dead we then found lying upon the plains near the sea! These people, inexperienced in the use of the arrow, the Turks had annihilated. Moved by pity at this sight, we shed many tears. And it was in the first week in June that we came, last of all, to the siege. One army was formed of the many, which though skilful in numbers estimated to be 600,000 strong. Of these, 100,000 were armed for battle, with leather corsets and helmets. If all who had departed from their homes on the pious journey had been present there, without a doubt there would have been six million soldiers. But at Rome, in Hungary, in Dalmatia, some, unwilling to undergo hardships, returned to their homes. In many different places thousands were killed, and some who went with us fell sick and died. Many graveyards were to be seen along the roads, on the plains, in the places where our pilgrims were buried. Our leaders ordered machines of war to be made, rams, scrapers, wooden towers and slings. Arrows were shot from the bows, and destructive stones were hurled. Our enemies fired at us, and we at them, each doing his best in these encounters. Turks often perished, struck by arrows or stones, and Franks likewise. Truly you would have grieved and sobbed in pity, for when they slew one of our men before the wall in any way, they let down iron hooks by means of ropes and took the body up. They snatched it away, and none of us dared or was able to wrestle it from them. After stripping the corpse, they threw the body outside. With our machines we often assailed the city, but because a strong wall resisted us, the attack failed. We left Nicaea on the third day, and advancing we came into the interior parts of Romania. But when we had been on the way for two days, it was reported to us that the Turks had set ambushes for us, and expected to join battle with us in the plains through which they thought we were going to pass. We did not lose courage, however, at this news. On that night we had our tents protected on all sides by guards. But early in the morning we took up our arms, and at the signal of the trumpet we divided into wings, with tribunes and centurions leading the cohorts and centuries. Then, with flags flying, we went out against the enemy in good order. At the second hour of the day, behold, their advance guards approached our scouts. When we had heard this, we pitched our tents near a certain marsh and took off our pack saddles, so that we would be better able to fight. When this was done, the emir and chief of the Turks, Solomon, who had held in his possession the city of Nicaea and Romania, gathered together about him the Turks and pagan Persians, 
who, after a journey of 30 days at his command, had come to his aid. Altogether, they numbered 360,000 fighters, all on horses and armed with bows, as was their custom. We, on the other hand, had both foot soldiers and knights. But at that time, Duke Godfrey and Count Raymond and Hugh the Great had been two days absent from us. Therefore, an irreparable loss resulted as much from the number of our soldiers who were killed as from our failure to kill or capture the Turks. And because those absent leaders received our messengers late, they were therefore late in coming to our aid. The Turks crept up, howling loudly and shooting a shower of arrows. Stunned and almost dead with many wounded, we immediately fled. And it was no wonder, for such warfare was new to us all. Already from another part of the marsh, a large column of them rushed violently up to our tents and, entering them, snatched our possessions and killed our people. What further shall I say? We were all huddled together like sheep shut in a pen, trembling and frightened, surrounded on all sides by enemies. The air was lashed with a great outcry from men, women and children, as well as from the pagans who rushed upon us. Now there was no hope of life left to us. Many, fearing that death was near, ran to the priests and confessed their sins. Weeping they sang, and singing they wept. Then, by the disposition of God, the advance guard of Hugh the Great and Count Raymond and Duke Godfrey came from the rear upon this unhappy scene. From the very first hour of the day until the sixth, as I have said, difficulties checked us. But then, Little by little, we recovered and were reinforced by our allies. Indeed, we continued our journey quietly, one day suffering such extreme thirst that many men and women died from its torments. Whole troops of Turks, fleeing before us, sought refuge by scattering throughout Romania. In these regions, we were very often in need of bread and other foods. For we found Romania, a land which is good and very rich in all products, thoroughly devastated and ravished by the Turks. Truly, one would not know whether to laugh or cry from pity, when many of our men, without pack mules, since many of theirs had already perished, loaded sheep, goats, hogs and dogs with their supplies, such as clothing and food, and whatever luggage was necessary for pilgrims, and knights with their armour, sometimes even mounted oxen. And who had ever heard such a mixture of languages in one army? There were Franks, Flemish, Frisians, Gauls, Lotharingians, Bavarians, Normans, Angles, Scots, Italians, Iberians, Bretons, Greeks, and Armenians. If a Breton questioned me, I would not know how to answer, either. But though we spoke diverse languages, we were, however, brothers in the love of God, and seemed to be nearest kin. For if one lost any of his possessions, whoever found it kept it carefully a long time, until, by inquiry, he found the loser and returned it to him. When our men and their horses, who had been wearied by much labour for many days, were refreshed by food and rest for four months at Antioch, they resumed their former strength. Having arranged a plan, one part of the army went into inner Syria, desiring to delay the march to Jerusalem. Other princes remained in the vicinity of Antioch. Count Raymond and his people seized Bara and Mara by a courageous attack. After the former city had been captured quickly and completely depopulated by the slaughter of its citizens and everything which they found there had been seized, they hastened to the other city. Here. When the siege had lasted twenty days, our people suffered excessive hunger. I shudder to tell that many of our people, harassed by the madness of excessive hunger, cut pieces from the buttocks of the Saracens already dead there, which they cooked. But when it was not yet roasted enough by the fire, they devoured it with savage mouth. So the besiegers, rather than the besieged, were tormented. Meanwhile, after they had made what machines they could and moved them to the wall, in an assault of great boldness with God favouring, the Franks entered over the top of the wall. And on that day and the following, 
they killed all the Saracens from the greatest to the least and plundered all their substance. And so Count Raymond, after Tancred joined him, continued the journey to Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem is situated in a mountainous region, lacking in streams, woods and springs. Here there is sufficient water sometimes, but occasionally the supply is reduced by drawing off the water. When the Franks viewed the city and saw it would be difficult to take, our princes ordered wooden ladders be made. By erecting them against the wall they hoped to scale it, and by a fierce attack enter the city, with God helping. After they had done this, when the leaders gave the signal and the trumpets sounded, in morning's bright light of the seventh day following, they rushed upon the city from all sides in an astonishing attack. After consultation, craftsmen were ordered to make machines, so that by moving them to the walls they might, with God's aid, obtain the desired end. So this was done. After the machines were prepared, they again prepared to assail the city. Early in the same morning, when they had gathered the machines and other auxiliary weapons, they very quickly erected the tower in compact shape not far from the wall. After it was set up and well covered by hides on the outside, by pushing it, they slowly moved it nearer the wall. Then a few but brave soldiers, at a signal from the horn, climbed on the tower. Nevertheless, the Saracens defended themselves from those soldiers and with slings hurled firebrands dipped in oil and grease at the tower and at the soldiers who were in it. Thereafter death was present and sudden for many on both sides. On the following day, at the blast of the trumpets, they undertook the same work more vigorously, so that by hammering in one place with the battering rams, they breached the wall. The Franks entered the city magnificently at the noonday hour on Friday, the day of the week when Christ redeemed the whole world on the cross. With trumpets sounding and with everything in an uproar, exclaiming, Help God! They vigorously pushed into the city and straight away raised the banner on the top of the wall. All the heathen, completely terrified, changed their boldness to swift flight through the narrow streets of the quarters. The more quickly they fled, the more quickly they were put to flight. On the top of Solomon's temple, to which they had climbed in fleeing, many were shot to death with arrows and cast down headlong from the roof. Within this temple about 10,000 were beheaded. If you had been there, your feet would have been stained up to the ankles with the blood of the slain. What more shall I tell? Not one of them was allowed to live. They did not spare the women and children. After they had discovered the cleverness of the Saracens, it was an extraordinary thing to see our squires and poorer people split the bellies of these dead Saracens so that they might pick out coins from their intestines, which they had swallowed down their horrible gullets while alive. After several days, they made a great heap of the bodies and burned them to ashes. And in these ashes, they found the gold more easily. O oh, time so longed for! O oh, time remembered among all others! O oh, deed to be preferred before all deeds! This was the place where the creator of all creatures, God, made man, in his manifold mercy for the human race, brought the gift of spiritual rebirth. Here he was born, died and rose, cleansed from the contagion of the heathen inhabiting it at one time or another, so long contaminated by their superstition. It was restored to its former rank by those believing and trusting in him.